Uh, we're going to turn now to, uh, to Moeen Curry. And uh, Moeen is uh, going to take us down, back down to the person level and look uh, very directly at the person and even below the skin level of what's going on. Moeen is uh, the founding director of CDC's Office of Public Health Genomics, which assesses the impact of advances in human genetics and human genome project on public health and disease prevention. And he's a senior consultant to NCI. He's been working with us now for several years. It's been a great addition to our, our staff. Among his many accomplishments, Dr. Curry started the Human Genome Epidemiology Network, uh, HugeNet, the Evaluation of Genomic Applications in Practice and Prevention Initiative, and the Genomic Applications in Practice and Prevention Network. He's a board certified in medical genetics. Dr. Curry received his medical degree from the American University of Beirut, Lebanon, and a PhD in human genetics and genetic epidemiology from Johns Hopkins. So we're glad to have him here as part of the team. We're glad to have a perspective uh, from the patient and from, the gen from personalized medicine and what it means in multi-level. Good morning. <clears throat> Thank you for the introduction. Um, there's a lot to cover in 10 minutes, but uh, <clears throat> as I was sitting at table seven yesterday and um, talking about, you know, what we heard, I kept saying to the group, it's complicated. And <laughs> now I'm going to get, get it even much more complicated than, <clears throat> than it possibly is and it will be. I would like to thank all my co-authors here. I certainly learned a lot from this experience, um, Steve Clauser and Mary Fennell and, and Russ Glasgow uh, were instrumental in helping this paper, but also uh, uh, Marin Schooner from the VA and Rand Corporation and Mark Williams <clears throat> from the Intermountain Healthcare, who are both pioneers in genomic medicine, and Sherry Shawley from DCCPS. So um, very briefly, I'm going to talk about both the promise and the challenge of genomic medicine, uh, talk about a uh, translational research agenda in the field, and how multi-level intervention research will apply or is already being applied, and then use one example, and then uh, raise a few issues for discussions. But I wanted to start with an anecdote. Actually, this is a, a paper that Francis Collins wrote back in 1999. Uh, Francis was the current director of NIH, used to be the, <clears throat> the director of the National Human Genome Research Institute at, at that time. And uh, he predicted that in the year 2010, this is how medicine will be practiced. And uh, he used a hypothetical uh, case scenario of a 23-year-old man named John who goes to his primary health care provider with a family history. His father has uh, early heart disease. And I'm going to add to the mix that his mother has breast cancer, but uh, that's my own flavor on this. And by the year 2010, which was last year, uh, John will get a printout of his uh, personal uh, genome profile which, by the way, you can do that right now in 2010. Um, I mean, you can get uh, genome-wide analysis of about a million variants <clears throat> uh, for about anywhere from two to two to four hundred dollars uh, directly on the internet, or you can have your whole three billion base pairs sequenced uh, for a price tag that's rapidly dropping. Now it's about five to ten thousand dollars, and will be very soon under a thousand dollars. So. On the basis of his printout, and these are obviously were fictitious numbers that Francis came up with, John is at reduced risk of prostate cancer and Alzheimer's disease. Uh, he probably doesn't need as many PSAs as, as others, I don't know. Or elevated risk of heart disease, colon cancer, and lung cancer. And, uh, and what Francis went on to say that John will have an individualized uh, treatment and prevention and early detection effort that's tailored to his genes a smoking cessation program, uh, because John happened to be a smoker. By the way, there is a test that you can do for uh, susceptibility to smoking. It's called Respirate Gene. I'm not uh, endorsing it, but it gives you a printout uh, of your lung cancer risk based on your genotype. Now, does that mean that uh, if you don't have that profile, you can continue smoking for the rest of your life? Um, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, colorectal cancer screening, uh, because he's at increased risk of colon cancer. And then uh, a tailored treatment for his high cholesterol based on pharmacogenomics. Now, many of these things are in the works. They're not happening. The numbers are fictitious, but although they're becoming uh, uh, more real by the day based on, on the science. 
But John's mother has breast cancer, and there are tools that are used today to differentiate using, based on the cancer gene expression profiles of the tumor, whether or not she needs her septum, whether or not her gene expression profile uh, would determine her risk of recurrence and therefore modulate therapy, whether or not she has a pharmacogenomic variant for CYP2D6, which will influence the way that which drugs she will take uh, for the treatment of breast cancer. John's father, on the other hand, has heart disease, and he's been worked up for familial hypercholesterolemia, a rare single gene disorder, and uh, also uh, he may be on a regimen to evaluate whether or not he has side effects to statins based on a rare genetic variant, and whether or not he needs uh, a pharmacogenomic test before he, he takes warfarin uh, for anticoagulation because he may or may not bleed as a result of that. This is not science fiction, folks. This is 2011. Some of this happening, some of this is not happening. But what we're faced with in genomics is a large evidentiary gap. I mean, you guys have been talking for the last two days about things that have been established that we need to move into practice. Genomics, by and large, is not there yet. But it's rapidly moving in a way that impinges on other, all other areas of practice, whether cancer or other, otherwise. Many challenges we fa face us, which gets us to the heart of the onion. I'm exploding, I'm opening up that on, onion for you here, and, and I surmise to you that these personal biologic characteristics of the, on the basis of the genotype of the people, as well as the tumors, and anything in between, uh, will affect everything we do. Uh, maybe not today, maybe 10 years from now. So how are we going to uh, enlarge our scope of multi-level intervention? So we have many genomic applications, uh, by last count, just the last year, we've done a, a survey. 250 new genome-based tests have been added to the market. Two-thirds of them are cancer-specific. And yet, we have incomplete information on genotype outcomes relationships, gene-environment interaction, gene-drug relationships, clinical utility, whether or not it will improve outcomes. And therefore, uh, there is uneven uh, coverage and reimbursement of these things, very little regulatory oversight. As I said, you can buy your genome online direct-to-consumer advertisement, unknown outcomes, and uncertain quality of lab testings, and a few more things. So where are we? Um, this is a, I don't want to uh, get into the weeds here about my uh, model of translation, the T1 to T4 model. Russ and I keep uh, arguing about this, and I'd love to argue some more. But I use it only as a, as a construct to show where cancer genomics is in terms of the research. So, you discover a few genes and a lot of more biologic insight, and then you develop promising application. That's your T1 bench to bedside model. There is a lot of that going on right now in, in cancer and other areas. T2, there is very little of that going on. This is the area where you take promising applications, you evaluate them clinically in trials, and then on the basis of that, you develop evidence-based guidelines, and there is very little of that in genomics right now. And then there is even less about implementation science and the kind of multi-level intervention research, and then even less of outcomes research that shows the re reduction of the burden of disease. So a couple of years ago, we did a portfolio analysis of the NCI funding in cancer genomics. We just published this paper. Uh, there was of a thousand genomics uh, grants that NCI funded uh, in FY 2007. The vast majority were discovery research a little bit of bench to bedside, and then it tapers off. T2 and beyond is less than 2 percent. This is where your evaluation, intervention, outcome research, health services, there was only one loan grant that looked at outcomes related to BRCA1. We also did a, a literature analysis at the time. It mirrors the same finding. Less than 2 percent of the published cancer genetics lit literature, actually less than 1 percent, is T2 and beyond. This is the field that we need more of in order to move these promising genomic applications into practice. So when writing the paper, and that it was really a very hard paper to write because most of it doesn't fit. We're still more upstream, and here we're talking about more downstream implementation. A few things came to mind uh, in the onion, the, especially with the clinical and lab interface. That's very crucial for genomics, what people call in clear terms the pre-analytic, analytic, and post-analytic. So many errors can happen. 
uh, and you know you order the wrong test for the wrong people based on uh, rapidly moving evidence. The behavioral, social, uh, science, and communication issues between patients, patients' families, patient provider diets are very, very important. And then healthcare organizations, some of them adopt, some of them don't adopt, and there is no framework for, for genomic medicine. The public health system uh, is by and large absent in this debate, but there is a little bit of uh, discussion about regulatory oversight. So in brief, folks, this is an area that is completely new and, and there is very little going on. Just one quick example, just to illustrate the complexity of it. How much time do I have? One minute. One minute. Okay, one minute example. So uh, four years ago, our office at CDC started a, a, an evidentiary panel, which is an independent panel dedicated completely to genomics. And we modeled it after the U.S. Preventive Service Task Force. Some of you may have heard about it. Uh, this group has been uh, doing developing methods, adapting new uh, methodologies, looking at outcomes, and they've evaluated about 10 genomic applications. More than half of them are related to cancer. The only positive recommendation they came up with is this one. So this is a rare genetic disease that affects about 3 to 5 percent of all new colorectal uh, cancer, and it's autosomal dominant. And you get colorectal cancer before the age of recommendation for screening, which is 50 and beyond. So what the EGAP working group found, and this, this is going to be a hell of an implementation uh, uh, in practice, so they found that there is sufficient evidence to recommend offering genetic testing for Lynch syndrome to all individuals with newly diagnosed colon cancer to reduce morbidity and mortality in their relatives. So basically, every year, we have about 150,000 new cases of colon cancer in the U.S., and about 3 percent of them, or more than 4,000, have Lynch syndrome. So the recommendation said that all new cases, regardless of family history, will have to be tested for Lynch syndrome. Why? Because once you get, you, you find those 4,000, the needles in the haystack, you're going to affect maybe about 12,000 of their relatives. These relatives have to be on uh, surveillance for colorectal cancer long before the recommended uh, you know, uh, 50 and, and beyond. So this is, this is something new. This is genomic medicine in, involving uh, family members. And we held an implementation meeting uh, last September at the CDC where we brought people together to discuss, you know, how, how this is possibly going to be done. Obviously, there are multiple levels uh, that, that could be used, but there are challenges. Providers don't know about this. Uh, why are we testing uh, cases uh, for something genetic uh, without their informed consent? Who's going to cover for it? Because the, uh, basically, you're not dealing with people in the same, same healthcare system. You have a, ca a cancer in one place, and then you know, the, the siblings will, uh, will be in another system or not uh, insured at all. Who's responsible for informing relatives? And there are infrastructure needs and then uh, testing limitations. So uh, suffice it to say, there is obviously with any new recommendations that come out, debate points and counterpoints to screen or not to screen. That is the question. And so I want to leave you all with a um, uh, few issues for discussions. Uh, obviously, uh, this is a, a new area that is going to affect everything we do in medicine, but not in, in a, the hypey way that people have been hyping it up, but maybe, maybe more incrementally over time, an evolution rather than a revolution. But the pace of the technology is moving quickly. So is there anything unique about it? Uh, or should we just subject, subject it to uh, the same way we've tackled everything else in medicine? And I'm mixed mind. I don't believe in genetic exceptionalism, but there are, uh, there are areas of uh, both quantity and qualitative differences we need to deal with. How do we do, deal with the lack of evidence? Uh, because uh, you're not going to be doing randomized clinical trial on everything that comes uh, your way, and it will change very quickly. Uh, how are we going to manage the push and pull forces of translation? Obviously, if you can buy your genome online and people are pushing it more uh, ups, you know, more one way, uh, I'm almost done. Uh, so thank you. He's doing his job. So, uh, so the question is, based on our review of the literature, there is really very little uh, implementation research uh, or T2, T3, T4 done, let alone it's multi-level. And you see it a little bit more in the rare single gene disorders like BRCA1. There is a, a heavy and uh, uh, um, heavy literature focused on uh, breast cancer genetics. So how are we going to develop that agenda that's actually informed 
by the other fields that we've been talking about. And perhaps maybe genomic medicine can inform these other fields, given that it's an out-of-the-box out uh, type thinking. Thank you very much. Thank you, Moeen. So here's an area where we can do some work and anticipate multi-level effects because uh, the actual delivery is, is not where we think it is.